<laughs> okay, so welcome everyone to our last guest lecture today. Um, today, Professor Bernd Rischoff uh, will talk about the CFR and Robert will um, introduce him in a minute. Before that, um, just some information um, about um, today's lecture and what will happen afterwards. So, um, of course, uh, you will have the chance to ask your questions um, after Bernd's talk, as usual. Um, thanks for all, the, for all the reports, the Moodle, I've read through them and I could see there were already some questions about the project. Um, I think we will um, discuss that later after the talk. Um, you will have the chance to ask your questions. Um, the task leaders for the next task will be the students from Italy or Ireland, or you know, if you decide that anyone else, uh, someone else should do that, um, that's up to you. Um, we will also send you a follow-up email for this talk today because uh, we would like uh, you to fill in the mid survey for the Valiant project. Um, and you should do that before Sunday, but you will get the link and the, and the reminder um, by email later today. Um, I think that's more or less it. We, we also ask you to let us know, you know, if you drop out of the, of the um, BIF, um, but I, yeah, you will, as I said, get a follow-up email with all the information. Um, now over to you, Rob, to introduce Ben. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ben, for being here. No worries. Pleasure Thank to be you. here. Thank you. Okay, so it's an honor for me to to introduce um, this afternoon, Professor Bernd Ruschow. Um, Bernd Ruschow is one of Germany's most respected experts in computer assisted language learning and applied linguistics. Uh, he was professor at the University of Education, where I first met him in Karlsruhe in Germany from 1993 to 98. Yeah. Right, Bernd. Yep. And then uh, after he went on to become professor at the University of Duisburg Essen where I think he has just retired very recently. So from 1998 until, to, until this year, he has been professor there of applied linguistics. Um, Bernd has also worked on numerous European initiatives, projects. He's been an evaluator. He's been an external expert uh, in so many different things that we can't really begin to, to, to name them. But I think uh, the reason why we, we asked Bernd to, to give up some of his afternoon and talk to us today was about the whole idea of the common European framework of reference because um, the, the, the CFR, which has been so influential, I think, in foreign language education over the past 20 years, um, has brought out a companion volume and Bernd has been involved in the development of this. So uh, I think we are very, very lucky to, to get to listen to somebody who has been working on this project and who has developed it and has been part of the, of the development of the whole project. To, to come and talk to us and to explain about, you know, because the, the way the CFR is developed, um, this is going to influence the way you, when you become language teachers in all your different countries, this is going to influence the way uh, your curriculum uh, are structured and the way people teach languages. So um, we're looking forward to listening to, to Bernd today and to for him to tell us a little bit about, about, you know, the significant developments in this new volume about the CFR. So over to you, Bernd. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks very much for that very kind introduction. I hope that you can all see my screen and my PowerPoint, hopefully. Hello, there yes, we are. We can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, because, uh, I mean, when Robert mentioned that I've been involved in technology enhanced language learning for decades, literally, um, I was almost cringing because uh, I just mentioned in the preparatory session that we just had before you joined us, uh, my university has just been a victim to a cyber attack. So the whole university is offline. So I'm using uh, Robert's Zoom and I'm uh, talking to you from home because my office uh, is offline, totally analog. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, CFR. Um, because um, there has been a kind of reincarnation of this, because uh, as Robert mentioned, it was originally published in 2001. And um, oops, uh, and things did change and develop uh, in terms of communicative practices over the decades, literally. So um, the Council of Europe decided to sort of develop um, an update, so to speak, and that's what I want to talk about. And the key terms that I want to focus on is can do and social agency, because can do is something that was introduced originally by the Common European Framework, 
the idea that learners can do something at any level and it's important to describe and make tangible what learners can do and social agency we're all using language in social context and that is important when it comes to teaching and learning languages so what i'm going to talk about today is the key message of the common european framework the idea that it's all about empowering learners so language teaching and language learning is about empowering learners and uh, pardon the pun uh, the, the typo in there but there's always a typo somewhere in the powerpoint obviously social agency already mentioned is something that can only be developed if you have a kind of task oriented action oriented methodological framework which is one that the council of europe proposes and that's also embedded in the common european framework um obviously as i just mentioned and i'm going to talk about that as well there are changing social and inter interactional contexts we're talking via zoom uh, that requires maybe different communicative practices and when you ask me questions later on there will be different interactional practices when compared with face-to-face -face interaction for example and that's all been integrated into the framework in its 2020 companion volume um, uh, version and that's obviously something I'm going to talk about not in great detail but at least hint at the areas where things uh, changed developed and descriptors uh, have been added so the key idea and the original idea of the common european framework as robert already hinted at is the idea that there is real world language use which should be the overall guiding principle of curriculum design of the teaching and learning that um, takes place in the classroom and beyond it should of course be um, at the basis of defining what kind of aims and outcomes we expect in language teaching and language learning and of course assessment is an important part uh, of that as well and the framework is is a framework that for the first time try to align all these in a system in a framework rather than looking at aims and then maybe designing some curricular principles um, looking at teaching and learning methodological aspects etc cetera, etc cetera, but really sort of see this as a whole framework and try to make sure that all these elements all these parts of the mosaic somehow fit uh, together there is a kind of urban legend um, that um, is still about that uh, understands the framework mainly as a tool for assessment and evaluation because that was the idea that people sort of put forward uh, language teaching language learning needs to be comparable across europe so that's what the framework is about providing sort of benchmarks and guidelines and comparable principles for assessment but that's only one little piece of the mosaic the rest is equally important and that's where the companion volume um, reiterates certain principles that um, are uh, proposed already by the first version of the framework. Um, as I said, the can-do descriptors were something new at the time uh, in early 2000 when uh, this was uh, uh, published originally. Um, before that, there was always this idea, learners need to learn something. The starting point here is, learners can some can do something so the idea of empowering learners to do something with language and using their communicative faculties at any level encouraging learners also to do something and to be active in the classroom rather than sitting and receiving instruction is uh, is a, another important aspect and when it comes to assessment it's not just testing and summarizing the results but it's formative it's supportive assessment because when learners do something the doing is important as well so when you assess um, uh, what learners are doing you have to also look at the processes that they're involved in the choices they make etc so this whole approach to assessment um, moving it from a less summative to a more supportive formative level is part of the um, uh, framework and its message as well and the important thing as i said it's can do rather than deficit traditionally people used to say okay you don't know a particular structure yet you can't say particular things yet in the target language so there's a deficit there you still have to learn something to be able to perform properly the 
starting point of the framework is at any level, you can do something. After the first lesson in a foreign language, you might already be able in simple terms to introduce yourself, to maybe say two or three things about things you like or that you don't like or the place where you live. That's already something that you can do in the target language. And that's the starting point of the framework, because as you see here, there are these A1, 2, C2 levels. So you can do this at any level, but you can do it differently. When you introduce yourself at an A1 level, you will simply say, hello, my name is, and I live in Wuppertal. When you are at a B1 or B2 level, you might say, hi, my name is Bernd, I am from Wuppertal, I like, and it's a very nice city, and by the way, I live in a flat, etc., etc., etc. So that's the basic idea. You can do at any level, but you do it differently. And that's the kind of progress that the uh, framework, in a way, um, defines. And that is something that guides, as I said, curriculum design, the aims and outcomes at various levels in language education, um, the methodological uh, approaches, action orientation, and also assessment and evaluation. So the key point of reference when it comes to methodological matters to classroom practice is the idea that social agency is the ultimate aim of language education and action orientation is the best way to uh, support that and foster these kinds of skills that you need to um, be a competent social agent. So social agents um, are people who work together, who have a certain purpose, and in a language classroom, this means the classroom provides the framework for collaboration, and it also defines a kind of purpose or a mission. So the outcomes and the content of language education need to fit in with that particular idea. It also means that learners take the initiative. So it's not the teacher spoon feeding like in traditional classrooms, but it's learners being allowed to take the initiative. Um, appreciating that they are operating within certain conditions and constraints. Uh, obviously, I mean, as I just said, if you can only, and I don't use the term only the way it sounds in that case, because that would be a contradiction in terms, but um, if you can do something at a particular level, you have to recognize these conditions and constraints and work within them, and then maybe try to sort of push the boundaries a bit further. That's also the idea of action-oriented learning. So operating within the conditions and constraints that you still have and trying to move beyond them. Mobilizing all the resources that uh, you need when you try to successfully develop um, cognitive growth is a sort of key term uh, often uh, referred to when talking about uh, teaching and learning. Um, strategic growth, very important as well, because I mean, if you have to learn or are put in a position where you can learn and decide for yourself how you want to go about a particular learning initiative that helps you to develop the kinds of strategies that you might need in the real world when communicating and when learning, planning and monitoring one's own actions and partaking in assessment evaluation is an important part of social agency as well. So basically, the methodological message of the framework is that language learning needs to enable learners to act in real life situations, in real life contexts, and the scheme fostering and proposing the action oriented approach uh, has this idea that when learners work together, united we're stronger as they say, they co-construct meaning through interaction. And this process of co-construction, of working together, of interacting in a learning context, is something that is much more fruitful when it comes to developing skills and competencies than being, as I said earlier, spoon-fed and being taught things in a sort of rather passive way. I'm not going to talk about the output hypothesis today because that's one of the sort of theoretical um, points of reference for this particular approach. But Meryl Swain um, uh, did find out that if you allow learners to create something together, the process of creation and interacting while creating is so valuable for the learning um, of languages that that is really the core idea of uh, social agency and 
action-oriented learning, but that's a different talk, so we're not going to talk about that today. Just briefly, it's human. It's in human nature. Piaget already said human beings are sense makers. We want to make sense of things all the time. So if we're put in a situation where we're allowed to make sense of things, we learn much better than being told what we're supposed to think and what sort of senses we're supposed to do. And I can't resist um, a, a kind of German quote there. Uh, you might not know Smudo, but he's uh, a part of a German hip hop band, uh, very famous, at least in the German speaking world. And um, some time ago, I read an uh, article with an interview with Smudo because they just released a new album. And he, in that interview said, well, Kreativität is ein menschlicher Reflex. So creativity is a human reflex. So we cannot not be creative. So best contexts for learning are the ones where we're allowed to be creative and work together. Okay, classroom practice already pointed out. This is just a quote that you will obviously get the PowerPoint, I presume, um, see in the PowerPoint. It basically means that learners are encouraged to use all their knowledges and abilities, uh, work in a as much as possible self-determined kind of autonomous context and uh, work on the full scale of competencies that are needed to communicate and interact in a target language. So action orientation embodies autonomy, fostering autonomy, learner autonomy. It also is grounded in the idea that language teaching and language learning uh, is always connected to the real world and relevant to what you're doing with language in the real world. It means that um, authenticity is key and authentication is important. Authentication meaning that um, it's not enough to use a newspaper article because it happens to be an authentic piece of document, but it has to be an article that learners can take on board, a topic, an issue that they're interested in. They need to authenticate that for themselves, otherwise that won't work in a language teaching, language learning context. And I already mentioned the output idea. Negotiating output collaboratively is an important part of that as well. Okay. Coming to the framework itself, um, obviously the world has changed and keeps changing. When I say things have changed, Herbert, Robert will understand that reference immediately because we used to have a good friend and professor in Karlsruhe who sometimes needed to be reminded of the fact that the world evolves and develops. Um, changes need to be acknowledged and the framework and the current um, companion volume just recently published takes on board the changes and the challenges that we encounter. Globalization, digitalization, the diversification of modes of communication that we now uh, have at our disposal, uh, interacting, social professional networking, um, telecollaborative scenarios, et cetera, et cetera, are all things that weren't there when the original framework was designed. And these are communicative practice and interactional practices, uh, practices sorry, that weren't represented in the original framework. So that's where the framework uh, or the team decided there needs to be a kind of reform or an adding to the framework. And one important aspect is also that in recent years, this idea of the native speaker ideal in the language classroom uh, has come um, under scrutiny to use that term for the time being, i.e. this idea that everyone should talk like um, the queen or now the king um, is maybe not uh, up to date when it comes to the communicative practices, particularly in the English speaking world, but in other worlds as well. So this is where the framework reacted. The descriptive schemes were added to or expanded as far as uh, the plurilingual disposition of human beings is concerned, the online interaction and online transaction that wasn't represented in the original framework, the genres, literature, for example, digital multimodal literature have changed, uh, the genres that are being produced as part of online blogs and online communication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, have expanded so that needs to be and is represented and reflected in the framework now and mediation is an important aspect that was already 
part of the original framework, but the concept of mediation has been expanded because mediation traditionally seen as something replacing translation, i.e. mediating meaning from one language into the other, is something that has been sort of uh, or is seen in a more holistic kind of uh, context in the present day context. So um, changes, as I said, in multimodality and digitally enhanced communicative practices are represented. The awareness of plurilingual dispositions that we have, the cultural artifacts that have changed, mediation as a more holistic um, concept when we talk about communicative and transactional practices, and mediation as being basically the core of social interaction and social practice is reflected and represented in um, the framework um, as it stands in the companion volume. So the CFR in a way now proposes a completely new construct when it comes to communicative competence, i.e. agency, and it covers all the interactional transactional practices that we are involved in and includes also the digital world which has become, and this was published before the, um, or developed before the pandemic, which has now become part of our everyday communicative and interactional practices, not just because of the pandemic. Um, talking about online, Interaction, transaction, I won't go through this list. Uh, when you just sort of glance at it, you will recognize a number of things that uh, ring true. I mean, uh, reactions to embedded media. I mean, using emojis and not misunderstanding the emojis and knowing what kind of emoji or other embedded media to use, uh, the symbols, uh, the images that you use as codes of messaging, et cetera, are something uh, that we need to appreciate and people need to be aware of. Uh, the cultural and intercultural kind of um, sensibilities that uh, are uh, involved there need to be um, uh, considered as well. Uh, emotional reactions, I mean, how do you react in an, in, in an online situation when somebody uh, is beginning to get a bit annoyed with you? You don't notice that immediately, maybe, but then there are certain uh, hints that you might uh, tune in um, and appreciate and you might react in a particular way. And it's more difficult, obviously, to handle emotional contexts in a digital world when compared with the face-to-face um, -face, uh, world. And that is also integrated in the descriptors. Give you an example. This is a typical page from the framework from the A1 to, I mean, I haven't got the C in there now, but you see these different kind of descriptors that basically describe the same kind of competence or agency at different levels and also different abilities or different can do um, aspects in there. So at the A1 level, you can comment on other people's online postings, provided they're written and signed in simple language. At the B2 level, you can already make some personal online postings about your experiences and feelings and respond individually to the comments of others. So you see um, how the descriptors on the one hand address different levels of the same thing that you do differently at different levels. And at the same time, then provide a, a backbone to integrating the kinds of linguistic competencies and the intercultural and the personal interactional strategic competencies, et cetera, that you need to develop, integrate those into the curriculum, into materials design, into um, uh, classroom practice. Um, show you a different one, which uh, in a way, as I said, this was developed before the pandemic, but for example, thinking about the fact that we have a lot of online interaction and online collaboration and transaction going on, not just during the pandemic, because some people appreciate now that some things are also quite effectively handled in a collaborative digital space. So. Um, you can deal with misunderstandings and unexpected problems in co collaborative activities. You can engage in online collaborative transactional exchanges and have the uh, language available that is needed there. You can take maybe a lead role in online collaborative uh, work, et cetera, et cetera. This is then also, and that's something that also was expanded 
um, and fine-tuned in the companion volume across the different kinds of uh, worlds that we use language in. When we do this at the personal level, we use different language when compared with doing this in an educational or in an occupational context. And uh, for example, if we talk about the educational, then you always have something that adds on and says, well, for example, in an online collaborative activity at school or university, or, um, and that's I uh, who added that one in a webinar, because webinars weren't part of the equation at the time when we thought about all these descriptors, but I mean, that's what you need to be able to do in a webinar, and based on the framework as it stands today, you can now sort of design learning contexts um, and materials and frameworks uh, taking the framework as a point of reference. Uh, further modifications, as I said uh, earlier, are um, modifications that concern mediation, because mediation is seen now as a much broader um, uh, construct, because it's um, mediating concepts. So if you want to say something and mediate what you want to say, um, the idea, the concept, etc., into another language that requires uh, certain agencies that go beyond mere translation. Um, mediating communication is an important aspect, i.e. the fact that if, uh, for example, there are two people and you're part of a, a situation in which people are communicating, they misunderstand one another, you might sort of mediate communication and manage communication in that particular context. Think about the online interaction and collaboration there. Mediating a product. How often do you meet someone and uh, they ask you what you did last night and you say, I went to the cinema and oh, what film did you see? Did you like it? Why did you like it? What was the film all about, etc.? So you've got a product, the film, you've seen it and you need to relate the information about that film and the content, etc., etc., uh, into a different format, into a report, in a review or whatever of that particular experience. And of course, this involves a lot of strategic competence and that's where the strategy and the strategic level of um, the agency idea uh, comes into play as well so the important thing now is that this is seen as something that happens and is very important across cultures and languages so mediating something uh, to someone for example in your own cultural community and using your own language as his or her language is one thing but mediating something to someone in a different uh, cultural context and a different linguistic uh, context um, requires different um, abilities across worlds because I mean you know you sometimes um, experience something in a digital world and you need to mediate that into the face-to-face -face world um, you sometimes experience something in a mediational representation and you need to mediate that into a different mediational representation. Imagine, for example, um, writing an email based on a face-to-face -face encounter rather than writing a report or rather than writing a letter, knowing how to mediate something into the appropriate shape and form of a given mediational representation. This is all part of the mediation uh, process and uh, the capsule videos that um, we are um, and have uh, produced. And you got some links to some of these videos explains how these things work in a language teaching language learning situation. So the idea of mediation is uh, holistic. It's focused on the idea that mediation is a social practice. So it has to do with understanding, with expressing and voicing, uh, and also negotiating meaning through and with language. And uh, it embodies the multimodal. So all the modalities that are involved in our daily practices when we use language in whichever kind of context. And it has obviously a lot to do with digitally enhanced meaning negotiation as well. And mediation requires the kind of social agency which is at the core of action orientation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One final aspect before you get your chance to ask uh, questions about this is the idea that 
we are all plurilingual in a way. We all experience languages, we encounter languages in present societies. It's impossible not to encounter uh, other languages, other cultures, etc., etc. And the framework has sort of in a way always proposed this idea that there are plurilingual repertoires that we can draw on when using language in a sort of intercultural plurilingual context. And these are also things that you might want to draw on and integrate into classroom practice when um, uh, teaching a foreign language. It's again also doing away with the deficit idea. For example, if you've got someone in your class who has another language as his or her second mother tongue or whatever, Often in the past, people said that's interfering with learning of English. So forget about these languages. Now the idea is that knowing and having that kind of linguistic experience as a person learning another language, you might want to benefit from that. And there might be strategies in there that you can use when you try to come to grips with another target language. So this idea of pluricultural and plurilingual dispositions and repertoires as valuable rather than as interfering and keeping these languages separate is something that is very much expanded in the new uh, framework and the native speakerism idea, I already spoke about that, is, is another one. So what we're talking about is languages are all interrelated and interconnected, particularly in our individual spheres because we encounter these languages. They are not kept in separate mental compartments, they interact and you can draw on these and you can if you learn or acquire how to sort of use that as a point of reference and maybe as something that might help you to understand something better in a language that you're currently learning, then that's a good thing. And all these knowledges and experiences of languages, rather than being challenging, contribute to communicative competence. If you talk with or observe bilingual or multilingual human beings, how they interact and communicate, how they sometimes code switch, not at random, but very, very cleverly, or how they use a particular word because it expresses in another language. It maybe gets a message across much better than using the exact word in whatever language they're speaking in general, then that is something that contributes to communicative competence. And this is something that needs to be acknowledged in language education as well. And rather than seeing all these other languages as challenges, they need to be fostered. And the strategic competence of drawing on these um, needs to be supported in a language teaching and language learning context. And the case study volume, uh, which was um, published in addition to the companion volume, uh, describes a number of case studies, how that can be put into practice in uh, a language classroom. Um, finally, before we finish, this idea of the native speaker, English or Englishes. I mean, what is a native speaker? Robert, with his Irish accent, are you a native speaker? Yes, you see. So someone teaching English, ignoring Irish as a native kind of variety and focusing on British English exclusively or in other parts of the world where American English or one variety of American English appears to be sort of the predominant variety is in a way disrespectful to all the Englishes that we have around the world. And this is something that is totally eradicated from the framework. So the word native speaker doesn't exist any longer in the framework. Wherever there used to be native speaker, we're now talking about user of the other language, proficient speaker of the language, interlocutor using the other language, et cetera, et cetera. So the native speaker was completely uh, eliminated because this is something, not talking too much about applied linguistics, that has been discussed and challenged in applied linguistics over quite a long time, but not accepted, unfortunately, but the nativeness and the gatekeeping power of saying, this is the real English, Irish English, forget about that. We need to talk like, yes, Robert, I appreciate your face there. No, no, but that's exactly the point. 
How can you do that? You cannot say this is English, this, 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 this one variety. You need to be a bit more open-minded, let's call it that. So the point is that uh, the native speaker ghost has been expelled, or at least should be expelled. I mean, the framework has expelled the native speaker ghost, but it should be expelled also from the language classroom. And what is even more important, particularly in the globalized world that we have, is that you need to be familiarized with all these varieties. So the idea of comprehensibility and intelligibility, rather than learning a language accent free or variety free, so to speak, is, is um, an important concept in language education because that prepares you for handling encounters in the real world. My personal experience is first time I went to England as a young kid, school exchange, etc. I ended up in Yorkshire. You can imagine that I didn't understand a word of what people were saying. I was silent for three days. I didn't understand anything. I didn't say anything because I hadn't been prepared for that. The idea of expelling the native speaker idea is prepare learners for handling variety, respecting variety, accepting that variety is whether someone speaks a Caribbean variety of English or a British variety of English or an Irish variety of English, doesn't matter. It's all real and you need to be able to handle that, okay? Funnily, at that time, when I came back to school after that exchange, my English teacher at the time then, I never forget that, said, young man, you're not uttering one more sentence in this class until you drop that funny accent. Back to the Queen's English, so to speak. So. What we have now is descriptors that can be integrated into language teaching and language learning, fostering the kind of abilities, the competencies that you need in order to handle all this diversity. Most likely you're encountering someone using English and you communicate in English with that person who's not a native speaker of English. And that is a challenge as well. So for example, phonological control is now something that's being defined and looked at in terms of, okay, it's intelligible. What makes things more intelligible for me? Uh, if I have an accent, okay, fine. I can live with that as long as I stick to certain parameters in order to stay intelligible or in order to be able to deconstruct what somebody is saying. How do you make sure that you are intelligible. And you always notice the fact, despite regular mispronunciations and maybe individual um, sounds, it doesn't matter as long as you are uh, intelligible, that works. And you can convey a message in an intelligible way in spite of a strong influence of your own language. But that's okay. You just have to make sure that you don't go below a certain level because the first thing when we discussed this with publishers was, well, can learners now say anything? What about the real English? The point is, real English is something that needs to be rethought and redefined. So the idea of comprehensibility, of intelligibility in human interaction uh, is an important one. And that's, again, something that has been um, expanded and added and the phonological control descriptors are one example into the new framework. So basically that's all I wanted to share this afternoon with you. Uh, you have some materials which I um, made available to, John, uh, to, to Robert and he I think sent them on to you, some videos that we've produced. Um, keep on the lookout because we're adding to the videos. Normally we produce about one or so um, every couple of months. So all the concepts and all the sort of more recent additions to the framework in the companion volume will be explained in these little capsule videos in a way. Go to the website where you have lots of documentation, the companion volume itself, um, additional materials, the case study volume that shows how these things can be put into practice are available uh, as well. So go and visit this particular website. Um, it's uh, an ongoing project. We're always adding and changing. So it's worth a visit every now and then. The link um, 
is here, but Robert has it as well, and I'll obviously make available the PowerPoint. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I was obviously only able to sketch things, not elaborate in greater detail, but that's maybe something we can uh, pick up on in, in the discussions. And as I said, the link is available. And so thanks a lot. And uh, the floor is yours now, as far as questions and so on is concerned. Thank you so much, Brent. Thank you. That was fabulous. Apart from those nasty comments you said about the Irish native speakers, I mean, I think we can get over that and we'll appreciate the rest of your yes, talk. Yes. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Slanger, Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So we'll have to forgive you for that. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe if you could stop sharing your screen, we'll um, we'll see everybody on screen. And if we have any questions or comments, you can either type them in as usual, or turn uh, just put up your hand, and I'll we'll come to you, and you can you can ask Brent yourself. Somebody's hand. Timo, well done, I, Timo. I, you can lo log on and, and I managed it. Um, well done. Thanks, Bent. I, I have a, just a quick question. Maybe it's kind of more of a mm, boring question, but this uh, you, you mentioned when talking about was action orientation, uh, the concept of authentication. Can, I didn't quite get the the concept okay. of authentication for learners. Okay. Explain it. Um, first of all, a good opener. There's no stupid questions. There are questions and they need to be addressed. Uh, the idea of authentication is when 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 people in the past initially talked about authenticity in the language classroom it was very much reduced to this idea okay we use authentic materials we bring real things into the classroom etc cetera, etc cetera. that's okay but it's not enough um because learners need to be able to relate to what they encounter in the classroom and it needs to be authentic to them so my example usually is uh, showing my age. I mean, me deciding that I want to use a Bob Dylan song in the language classroom might be okay and authentic for me because I happen to like Bob Dylan, et cetera, et cetera. He was part of my sort of um, uh, becoming aware of music and so on and so on. But it's not necessarily something that's of interest to the learners. I might be better off with a pink song, for example, because that is maybe a song that learners can relate to much better because, I mean, for example, the, the textbooks always have these protest songs, for example. Um, and when we were doing school practice, a teacher we worked with insisted on using an old protest song to discuss American politics. At that time, that's why I'm talking about Pink. Pink had just done a song called Mr. President. And we suggested, why not use that song? Because it's closer to the learner's experience and so on. No, 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 we have to do that protest song. The lesson fell flat on its face, but that's authentication. When you as a teacher decide what you want to do in the classroom in terms of activity, in terms of materials, in terms of topics, in terms of issues, um, always keep in mind something that you like and consider as valid and interesting and important might not necessarily be what the learners can relate to. So authentication means they need to be put in a position where they can authenticate what they are being uh, presented with. Thanks. Okay, Timo, that makes sense to you, does it? Yeah, that answers your question. Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? I have a question, Bernd. Well, if in, if you don't mind, I've been reading up. <clears throat> I've been reading a lot of this uh, companion volume lately, and they insist on the idea of connection to the real world, yeah. right? Which I don't think is the same concept as us, as what Timo was mentioning, right? It's kind of set, so that you get students to do projects, scenarios, tasks that are in some way connected to the real world, yeah. right? Now. I, I understand the, the principle behind that, and I think it's very nice, and I think it's admirable, but do, do you not think that this is like a, on a day-to-day -day basis for your average foreign language teacher in a secondary school in Germany or Spain or Lithuania or wherever they are, trying to get students to do tasks that are, you know, very clearly connected to their real worlds is a big challenge? I mean, is that not like a big ask? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, the challenge is twofold, because the one thing is connecting to the real world means that the kind of competencies and agencies that you try to develop and foster in the language classroom need to be 
the kinds of agencies that are relevant to the real world. So, for example, learning and acquiring how to write an email in English appropriately is something that prepares you for using the language in the real world. So that's that's the one uh, idea. The second idea is that what you do in the classroom should somehow also resemble at least to a certain degree what happens in the real world. So if you want to prepare someone for effectively communicating in an online collaborative context, the best way to do that is to create a similar kind of online collaborative learning activity in the classroom, mm -hmm. or at least do some sort of collaborative group work um, kind of activity that sort of puts learners in a position where they have to work together, where they have to negotiate meaning together, et cetera, et cetera, and thus gradually sort of developing the kinds of then competencies that they need in the real world. So it's it's the practice, the classroom practice shifting from a more teacher-centered instructional kind of paradigm to a collaborative learner-centered paradigm. And it's also redefining the aims in terms of the kinds of things that people need when they use the language in the real world. That's That's the two levels. I mean, there's okay. even more, but that's that's the key idea. Okay, okay, I get it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, my colleague Anna, Anna Moreno here at the University of Leon would like to come in. Anna, do you want to turn on your camera or your or your speaker and talk to us? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Sorry, I had to come in a bit late. I think I got you half through halfway through the through the talk but uh sorry i had a family commitment and uh i was listening uh, at the point where you were talking about uh, uh this idea of nativism mm -hmm. uh which we are now doing away with for which i'm really very happy um, and i was one of the reasons why i am very very um, you know, I, I agree. I agree with this approach very much. Uh, well, apart, apart from other things, as, uh, of course, um, but also the idea of emphasizing uh, the use of uh, the students' uh, first uh, knowledge of their first language as something positive, yeah. as something that can be transferred. And, you know, rather than just focusing on the interference of you know the, those uh, features that are different uh, across languages. And I think. There should be a way uh, of exploiting that um, uh, in better ways that uh, we we have been doing in Spain so far because we we have moved to the opposite extreme where we have uh, completely you know denostated the use of the first language in the classroom and um, and this is where we are still you know we we still are okay so I would I would like you to comment on 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 you know possible ways in which that could be incorporated in the in the language uh, the english language uh, mm -hmm. teaching situations nowadays and um, and in relation to um, the previous question about how to you know um, turn the classes uh, the, the the classes into into or, or the, the task that you will use in the classes into something more realistic and and you know the need to contextualize the task that we use and and so on and so forth. For example, just to speak in very specific terms, uh, would that would this mean, for example, that instead of uh, teaching students to write prose and cones essays, we would you know encourage them to write other kinds of tasks like you know, report or something where they would have to evaluate the the positive and negative features of some reality in order to draw some conclusion and of course then the essay would not be considered as a school in genre but it would be more like a, a genre sorry a, a text type that is embedded in a genre for a real communicative purpose which is what i think we we should be teaching <laughs> yes I mean, the two things, I mean, the, 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 the native speakerism idea is, is that, as, as Robert um, reacted to um, quite nicely, is this, this misunderstanding that uh, when you learn a language, another language, there is only one variety of that particular language, which is the one that needs to be taught in the language classroom. And if you deviate from that norm, you can't use the language properly. First yes. of all, that's unrealistic, because as I said, I mean, the two of us are, or all of us now, are interacting using English. 
Yes. English is not my mother tongue. English is not your mother tongue, etc., etc. But somehow we understand one another because indirectly, because we've had all these en encounters and we are sort of somewhat experienced linguists, that's where the plurilingual disposition comes in, we're able to understand one another because, I mean, you're able to understand my accent and if I mispronounce something, you can sort of, you know, fill the gaps and understand it. I can understand you and so on. So that's, that's this idea of accepting that there is variety and each variety of a language is a valid means of communication and interaction. And you are likely to encounter more of these varieties when you're in the real world than the standard norm variety. That's the one thing. So equipping learners with being able to appreciate and also understand and deconstruct sometimes, um, this is, is an important aspect. The second aspect, the plurilingual disposition, is again this idea, move away from the deficit and the problem approach to benefit. And in the language classroom, I mean, one thing which also contributes to integration, and um, there are programs that uh, prove that, um, if you get, for example, current class classrooms are all uh, multilingual diverse, okay? If you create a situation where a child with another language and another linguistic background experiences in class that this is something that might be useful, then that helps. For example, if you, um, if you, if you work on a new concept or a new word or a new structure, asking this person, well, what about your language? Is this something that is similar to your language? Is this something that you have as well? Is this something that you can, oh yeah, there is this word in my language, which sounds almost similar. So, ah, remembering that, might help me the next time, or trying to find a word like that might help me next time to understand something more easily. And that experience is also a rewarding experience for the learners and it opens to languages and so on and so on. That's that's an important aspect. So that's the idea of, of, of sort of the native speakerism and the plurilingual disposition and drawing on plurilingual repertoires. And as I said, there is a case study volume that also shows how this kind of plurilingual approach to language teaching can be put into practice so that's 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 okay. in there um, okay. the, the the other thing that's the mediation and the practice part in the classroom um, that's exactly the point broaden the scope of what you do don't just do the kinds of things that used to be standard diet in the language classroom write an essay is a standard task in the language yeah. classroom what is an essay it's one kind of representation of writing something to get an opinion or a message across. Why not write something different? Why not invite learners to create a classroom blog and keep reporting what happens in the class into that blog? And maybe even get some people react to that blog and then answer questions that people might have. Mm -hmm. Writing um, a different kind of um, representation of voicing your opinion rather than just the sort of argumentative essay or something like that. So broadening the scope of activities when producing something in the target language is very much part of that idea. Yes. Bernd, we're going to have to interrupt both of you now, I'm afraid, because we're only, we've only got five minutes left or four minutes left and we, we try to, to finish these, these meetings punctually. Um, uh, there's, there's another very... Uh, interesting question in the text by Monse. But um, if you don't mind, Bernd, I'll, what I'll do is I'll pass it on to you by email and, and maybe you could respond to her by email because it's um, the one about the idea of mediation. Mediation and, and learner is yeah. user as social agent. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. So that, again, might take a little bit more time to, to explain. The, I mean, I think what we've seen here is, um, the, you know, the, the ideas that are coming up in the Common European Framework or Reference, the new book especially, uh, and they, they're complex ideas, okay? These, these ideas that are going to take teachers, it's going to take us time to get our heads around and to understand and to understand the implications for the way we teach languages, okay? So, but I, I'm really appreciative that um, that Brent has taken his time today to, to come and talk to us about this and just to, sh to highlight, so to speak, the most important ideas that are in this new volume, okay? That, uh, like, I mean, as he said, 
Um, and what we'll do is in the email that we send out to you this afternoon with Bernd's recording, and if it's okay with him with this PowerPoint, we'll also include the link to this new volume that you can download and read it yourselves. Okay, it's free. It's not you don't have to buy it or anything. And um, I, I don't know, Sina, is there any other thing we want to point out before we end our session today? I think there's a couple of other just quick reminders, isn't there? Well, first of all, thank you, Bernd, uh, for your talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are a couple of things, but I think um, most of them we can we can put in that email. I think um, I will. Well, I will meet the German students after this. So um, German students, please stay stay here in the room. And if your groups have any questions, I can also answer them then because we don't really we wanted to ask. Uh, we wanted to answer questions for the project, but I think it's, there's not enough time now to do that. Mm, um, yeah. Well, just a reminder that you will have to um, meet your working group on Friday and also that next Tuesday uh, we invite everyone again to participate in our session. We won't have a guest lecturer next um, next week, but next it will Tuesday. be um, yeah, yeah next Tuesday, but it will be um, a chance for you to start work, working on your project. So whoever um, can you know make it um, next Tuesday again 4 pm um, then um, yeah, you're welcome. Um, we'd be happy to to um, to see you then, so that you can start working in your working groups on your project. Mm -hmm. um, can I just say one thing? Because I mean, that is something in direct reply to uh, Monse's question. There is a whole webinar online available on the Council of Europe website, the one that I identified, that addresses the issue of social um, agency and mediation. Um, so you can just watch that. All the webinars and all the sessions, the colloquia that we have done, have all been recorded and they're also available online. And one that addresses that particular question is available on the website of the Council of Europe. That's great. Yeah, yeah. there's a huge amount of resources um, available about this new volume and about the concepts in the new volume. OK, thank you very much, Bernd. It was wonderful to, to listen to you. It was really enjoyable. I think you explained these concepts really well. And I really appreciate that you've given up your time on, um, on today to, to come and talk to us and thanks to everybody for joining us okay and we'll we, like I said we'll meet again next week next Tuesday as Sina says we won't have a guest lecture but we will use it for our working group times okay so that will so please take time to to join us next Tuesday okay thank you very much everybody uh, Sina you want to continue with your group I imagine right I'll, put, I'll pass the, this over to you now right exactly thank okay you. all right thank you everybody bye bye okay cheers bye bye thanks a lot Okay, so I presume I'll just leave and uh...